the creator has truly made everything beautiful, David, including the song, and uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, you received a card as you came in, and if you have a, a question uh, that you would like to address to Dr. Ray, uh, fill the card out, uh, brief questions, and we will collect those at the end of the lecture. And we'll have a time of q and A. I'm given to understand that Dr. Ray can answer every single question as a college president. That's what he has been trained to do. Uh, Dr. Ray, we're very, very pleased that you're here. Dr. Alan Ray is a uh, citizen of the Cherokee Nation. And as you know from our announcements, he is the president of Elmhurst College. He's been in that position since 2008. He completed his uh, JD at the University of California and also obtained a PhD in religion from Harvard University, making him a very able candidate to speak to us this evening. As a teacher, Alan Ray has focused on questions of religion and philosophy, as well as Native American issues and the courts. Not surprisingly, at Elmhurst, he holds a faculty appointment as professor of religion and society. He's published in the area of theology and also um, wrote in various law journals with a focus on Native American legal issues. His legal expertise was honed in law practices both in Los Angeles and Boston, and he is known as a scholar of federal Native American law. As an educator, Dr. Ray is committed to a vision of the liberal arts, which makes our hearts sing here at Wheaton <laughs> College, which joins together, as he says, reconciling reflection and action. While at Elmhurst, he has opened the doors to discussions about First Nations issues. Uh, during his inauguration, one could hear the sound of Native Americans singing in drums along with the sweet smell of sage. Under his leadership, Elmhurst College inaugurated a Native American Awareness Week and has integrated Native American issues into the curriculum in an intentional celebration of diversity. He is the joyful husband of Angela, who graces us with her presence here this evening and uh, also the father of cheer three children, which I understand have heard dad talk enough so they did not come this evening. <laughs> Alan Ray is well qualified as a lawyer, a theologian, Native American, uh, to speak to us on the doctrine of discovery and the conquest of the Americas. Please join me in welcoming our friend, President Alan Ray. Gene. Thank you, David. And good evening. Uh, as a college president, uh, I'm probably qualified to answer no questions, but ask many. So uh, I hope that you'll uh, bear with me if uh, I have any difficulty in that regard. But truly, good evening, and thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I look forward to your questions and your, your engagement with this uh, lecture. Tonight I'd like to tell you a little bit about one of the principal agents of social transformation in the modern era, the doctrine of discovery, and how it's affected the indigenous peoples of our country and others around the world. The American Society of Church History has called the doctrine, quote, one of the most important historical and contemporary issues that native activists and communities talk about, educate regarding, and work against. And yet, the vast majority of non-natives I've never heard of it." Unquote. The story of the doctrine of discovery is not a pleasant one, uh, but it may be a subtle one if I do my job properly. In the time we have, I can't hope to do justice either to the historical and legal complexities of the doctrine nor the wide scope of its influence across more than 500 years. Uh, so relax, I won't even try. <laughs> what I can do is to make a case that how the doctrine of discovery was developed and employed by conquest and in the courts reveals much more than an abstract legal principle. The doctrine not merely provides the legal rationale 
for separating Indians from their homelands. The doctrine is interesting to me and, and perhaps interesting to you because of its assumptions. Its assumptions about land, about race, about religion, and ultimately about legitimizing the deployment of power and its institutions not merely to take land, but to create people and to sustain them in legal and cultural relationships to those institutions, relationships based on the suppression of fear and the fetishizing of property. The doctrine of discovery, then, is more than a medieval artifact embedded in our culture. It is an important underpinning of modern metaphysics, a philosophical anthropology of difference that is buried deep within the norms of our culture, indeed, deep within our own minds. What I can offer you, then, is a bit of amateur archaeology, a retrieval of this artifact, as evidenced by what the philosopher Hans-Georg Gadamer would call its effective history, or more simply, its ubiquitous presence in our lives today. To begin, the doctrine of discovery is a creature of the medieval papacy and the crown heads of Renaissance Europe. The doctrine rests on a historical notion that the American Society of Church History has called, quote unquote, deceptively simple. In an age of normative Christianity, the doctrine decreed that the discovery of lands by an agent of a Christian monarch conferred legal title to those lands on the discoverer's sovereign. First in time is first in right. Throughout the 15th and into the 17th centuries, European expeditions following Columbus went in search of riches, encountering new lands around the globe. In a most physical way, by performing some symbolic act like planting a flag or reciting a formula, the explorer could establish title for his prince that was good against the world, or at least the European part of the world. The only thing that could defeat such a claim was a finding that another Christian expedition, operating in the service of another monarch, had beaten the discoverer to the punch. The doctrine of discovery operated to make conquest highly efficient in the sense used by economists, in that it saved countries from the plague of costly and bloody wars with each other over newly taken territories. The elements of the doctrine of discovery then are these. First, the physical, if brief, occupation of land. Two, by an agent of a Christian monarch, on the understanding that three, the land was devoid of other Christians, i.e., not previously discovered by another similarly empowered agent. How was this done? When Columbus, political alchemist, stepped foot on Guanahani Island and turned base dirt into Spanish gold, scholars believe that between 50 and 100 million human beings were living in what is now North and South America. Did the Spaniards owe these people any duties at the moment of first encounter? To the extent that the legitimate use of the doctrine depended on a Christian monarch, the duties of Christians pertain to all explorations. The people living on the lands, therefore, were the proper objects of religious conversion, another kind of alchemy that transformed so-called heathens into believers and paved the way for the development of the land and its resources for the benefit of the discovering country. Missionaries, therefore, traveled with soldiers, each performing discrete functions within a unitary colonizing imperative. An illustration will show, I think, how the doctrine worked in practice in the hands of Spanish explorers of the early 16th century. Mindful that before you can hold someone accountable for refusing what the law requires, you must provide them with reasonable notice. Mindful of this, the leaders of Spanish expositions at this time were required to read something called requerimento, or requirement. The requirement, as legal scholar Robert Williams has written, quote, informed the Indians in the simplest terms that they could either accept Christian missionaries and Spanish imperial hegemony or be annihilated, unquote. Lewis Hankey, perhaps the foremost scholar of the 20th century and the colonization of Latin America, offers a very vivid picture of how things went down in practice, and I'd like to read this to you uh, complete. A complete list of the events that occurred when the requirement formalities ordered by King Ferdinand were carried out in America, more or less according to law, might tax the reader's, reader's patience and credulity, for the requirement was read to trees and empty huts when no Indians could be found, 
Captains muttered its theological phrases in their beards on this edge of sleeping Indian settlements, or even a league away before starting the formal attack. And at times, some leather-lunged Spanish notary hurled its sonorous phrases after the Indians as they fled into the mountains. Ship captains would sometimes have the document read from the deck as they approached an island, and at night would send out slaving expeditions whose leaders would shout the traditional Castilian war cry, Santiago, rather than read the requirement before they attacked the nearby villages." Unquote. I note, of course, all this reading, if you were standing directly in front of an Indian, would be done in Spanish or Latin. Really, it would be humorous, really, wouldn't it, if it were not so tragic. Williams tells us that by the time the requirement was abolished in 1556, Spain controlled most of the major population centers in Latin America. With the army ensconced and Spain legally in charge, the project could shift, as so many do, from military conquest, again authorized by the doctrine of discovery, to a missionary endeavor protected by a police presence. As Williams neatly observes, quote, law, which Europeans have long revered as their instrument of civilization, became the West's perfect instrument of empire in the heart of darkness that was America. Let me offer you a quick metaphysical diversion. And since I invoked metaphysics in my preliminary remarks, let me observe that, in my view, the first bitter fruit of the doctrine of discovery was the epistemic transformation of dirt and water and woods into real property. Before Columbus landed on Guanahani Island, the land was just that. It was land. After, it was the New World, and it belonged to Spain. Similarly, prior to Columbus, the people of Guanahani and thousands of other places on this continent and elsewhere enjoyed the power of naming to designate themselves and their world. After European conquest and colonization, they were certainly known by many names, all given to them by imperial agents, and all of them extreme. Indians who resisted colonization were simply savages and heathens, read bad, to be killed. Those who cooperated were akin to children in a state of nature, good to be trained and later assimilated. The writings of Columbus himself attest to this. It would be hundreds of years before the indigenous people of this continent, that is, those who survived, were encouraged to name themselves again and live life from their own frames of reference. The social construction of what we often call Indians began literally with Columbus and has not ceased to this day. What all the names given to indigenous peoples have in common is that they signify the other, that which is not us. And yet, for those with religious or secular universalist commitments, Indians are part of us. Indians are human beings. Even the 16th century Spaniard, priest, and scholar, Francisco de Victoria, the very first to advocate for native rights, struggle to reconcile society's experience of radical social difference to the universality of reason, and hence the universality of human rights based on natural law. This will be an abiding tension from this point forward in Western history. Others, who saw Indians only in an ulterior form, had no such internal struggle, no such cognitive dissonance. When we ask, where genocide against Native Americans comes from. Philosophy of difference provides a partial answer. If you think someone is wholly the other, it's not so difficult to take steps to eradicate them. If you, uh, if you believe that they have the capacity for reason as part of a common human nature, cognitive dissonance, it becomes less easy to do that. For many, however, as the Renaissance became the Enlightenment, the tension between competing world frames or epistemes one seen indigenous peoples as ontologically different from Europeans and later Americans, and the other seen them as exponents of a common humanity grew in intensity. This was especially true here in the New Republic of the United States, where an accelerating drive for land encountered at close quarters still powerful tribes dwelling on their ancestral soil. The pragmatic question of how we deal with these people was inextricably bound up with the metaphysical question, what are they do? What rights do they have as Indians, as the other 
who is also us. This question, implicit at the instant of first contact, has literally haunted the West in one avatar or another for over 500 years, since it goes to the very nature of the quote unquote uncivilized, and for Westerners, our uncomfortable, continual, and intimate proximity to it. Indeed, the uncivilized lives, it lives as close to us, it lives as close to us as the monstrous nightmares engendered by the so-called sleep of reason experienced by Goya's dreamers and Los Capricos. I add parenthetically, modern psychology often asks, to what do we owe our dreams? When the better, more therapeutically promising question may be, what do we owe to our dreams? To summarize, in the courts of the United States at the turn of the 19th century, the question took a form that combined ontology, jurisprudence, and pure, unadulterated politics. Namely, what do we do with a fundamental medieval doctrine grounded in objectionable supernatural authorities, or at least Catholic ones, it is the Enlightenment after all, that has served landowners extremely well for over 300 years, when we can no longer look to the doctrine's religious roots or monarchical associations for public legitimacy. Think about that. What a different world it's operating in in the late, uh, late uh, 1700s, early 1800s. How different are the assumptions that it must make? What do we do with these, these ugly supernatural roots uh, in the American, uh, American New World? The answer, given by Chief Justice John Marshall in 1823 in the landmark case of Johnson v. McIntosh, would provide nothing less than the foundation of federal Indian law and policy for the 19th, the 20th, and now the 21st centuries. To Johnson v. McIntosh. The question of this pivotal case was rather simple. Could a non-Indian who acquired property from an Indian nation, either directly or through a chain of transactions, pass on a title, call it Indian title, that would be recognized by the United States? At the time the case arose, Hundreds of landowners had taken title from the United States or its predecessor in interest, Great Britain. But perhaps an equal number, including the founding fathers, Washington, Jefferson, and Thomas Paine, had taken title stemming from Indian tribes. Invalidating Indian titles would invalidate their claims to these lands and harm their investments. In addition, Marshall was, to be fair, attentive to the harsh impact of holding the doctrine of discovery would have on tribes still dwelling on their ancestral lands and living in peace. Finally, Marshall, ever the Federalist, was concerned that allowing tribes to convey their lands to anyone they liked would undermine the exclusive constitutional and now statutory rights of the United States to deal with Indian nations. In the end, Marshall determined three things. First, that the doctrine of discovery must be upheld and the United States, by lawfully taking over the rights of Great Britain, acquired an absolute and exclusive title to the lands previously owned by that country. Two, that nevertheless, the Indian nations retained a right of occupancy, a right of occupancy of the <coughs> land after discovery. And third, but that this right of occupancy could be extinguished by the United States through purchase or conquest. It is important to understand why Marshall ruled as he did. He didn't seek to buttress the doctrine by adverting to the medieval papal bulls or the rights of Christian princes. In his famous opinion, he does not even mention them. They are too embarrassing, right? Instead, he made one of the most candid defenses of might makes right that one will ever see in legal opinion. He said, and I quote, conquest gives a title which the courts of the conqueror cannot deny, unquote. I'll say that once more. Conquest gives a title, conquest gives a title which the courts of the conqueror cannot deny. And he thought it was a pretension that discovery could be equated to conquest. However, quote, if the principle has been asserted in the first instance and afterwards sustained, if a country has been acquired and held under it, if the property of the great mass of the community originates in it 
it, the doctrine of discovery, becomes the law of the land and cannot be questioned, unquote. Marshall acknowledged that denying Indian nations anything more than a right of occupancy to lands they had lived on since time immemorial flew in the face of natural law and the rights recognized by quote unquote civilized nations. That's the, they are, they are also like us piece, right? Yet he said, quote, if it be indispensable to that system under which the country has been settled and be adapted to the actual condition of Indian nations in the United States, it may perhaps be supported by reason and certainly cannot be rejected by courts of justice, unquote. Hardly a ringing endorsement of his own position. And herein lies the rationale that would support the removal of the so-called five civilized tribes from their homelands in the southeastern United States, the systematic and near total acquisition of Indian lands by treaty or by now legally justified conquest and the sale of these lands to settlers, the rounding up of Indians and their consignment to reservations, these reserved of traditional lands, the Indian wars of the late 19th century spurred by the discovery of gold on lands owned in what absolute fee by the government and made available to whom? prospectors and settlers, and in this very century, the judicial denial that Indians have a First Amendment right to worship on ancestral lands now owned by whom, in what, in fee by the United States. If anyone has any doubt that the doctrine of discovery as interpreted by Marshall 200 years ago in Johnson v. McIntosh is alive and well, he or she need only study the case Tiaton Indians versus the United States, where the U.S. Supreme Court in 1955, held that the doctrine of discovery and the vesting of absolute title in the United States barred claims by the Clinkett tribe of Alaska that the federal government had violated the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment when, for absolutely no compensation, the government had assumed possession of over 350,000 acres of land and its timber plus 150 square miles of water, land and water, that the Clinkett had called home since their ancestors crossed the land bridge over the Bering Strait 20 to 25,000 years ago. The court cited chapter and verse of Marshall's logic that might makes right. Think about that. And as recently as 2005, the Supreme Court in City of Sherrill versus Oneida Nation expressly relied on Johnson v. McIntosh and expressly on the doctrine of discovery, see footnote one, to hold that Indian nations could not reassort sovereignty over ancestral lands that had been sold to New York State after the Revolutionary War, before the federal government's constitution had been adopted. In effect, the court was saying that before there was a United States of America, the 13 individual states, including New York, enjoyed the rights of fee ownership established by the doctrine, sort of like a mini-me for the United States and its rights. Hence, when the Oneidas sold to New York, the deal was good, and the Oneidas had only a right of occupancy, which was incapable of supporting a much le later legal claim for sovereignty over the land. 2005. Yet the legal rights of Indian nations and the United States continue to be structured according to the doctrine of discovery, as they clearly are. We must then ask, I think, are the metaphysical assumptions of Indians as the other who is us also operative. Records of the late 18th century show clearly that at the time of the founding of the Republic and the establishment of federal Indian policy, the indigenous inhabitants of this country were viewed with a mix of suspicion and condescension by those in charge of setting this policy. No less than George Washington, just four days after the Treaty of Paris, shrewdly recommended that Congress try and gain Indian land through treaty rather than war, which he viewed in today's parlance as inefficient. While Washington seems to have regarded unproblematic the application of the European model of state-to-state -state relationships to the United States dealings with Indian nations, he was a man of his time in viewing Indians themselves as savages. He distrusted Indians in the same way one wisely distrusts fierce animals. Indeed, he repeatedly compared Indians to wolves, and in a striking passage of his recommendations to Congress, sketched out a strategy for gaining Indian land that relied on the beast-like character of Indians. He wrote, and I quote, policy and economy point very strongly to the expediency of being upon good terms with the Indians. 
and the propriety of purchasing their lands in preference to attempting to drive them out by force of arms from their country, which, as we've already experienced, is like driving the wild beasts of the forest, which will return as soon as the pursuit is at, is at an end and fall, perhaps, on those who are left there. A great image. Why do this? When the gradual extension of our settlements will as certainly cause the savage, as the wolf, to retire, both being beasts of prey, though they differ in shape." Unquote. Cynically, Washington called for the government to enter into treaties that would exchange Indian lands for cash and the promise of federal protection against encroachment by white settlers and draw a clear li territorial line between tribes and settlers. But of course, he was simultaneously relying on the gradual westward expansion of these same settlers to drive out the Indian beasts for good. The line drawing was a fiction. Congress quickly approved Washington's recommendations, thus committing the new nation to pursuing a dual strategy of treaty making to secure boundaries and a real politic that would embrace and facilitate westward expansion across those very same lines. Note well that the rationale for and justification of this deception, where one needed, rests on the ontological presumption that Indians are not as human as Americans. They are rather beasts of prey. Though different in shape, they are of the same nature as vicious animals. This is an ontological judgment, and this was our country's first Indian policy. So, when Justice Marshall penned Johnson v. McIntosh some 40 years later, he too would rely on the subhuman nature of Indian people to justify the application of the doctrine of discovery, specifically the right of the federal government to ex extinguish Indians' right of occupancy through conquest. Marshall said that while he himself would not defend the rationality of the doctrine of discovery's application to Indian title, still, Europeans that did were excused if not justified by, quote, the character and habits of the people whose rights had been wrested from them. The character and habits of the people whose rights had been wrested from them. Tribes consisted of, quoting Marshall, fierce savages whose occupation was war. They were ungovernable as a distinct people because they were as brave and as high-spirited as they were fierce. As if in fulfillment of Washington's prophetic words, Marshall, those 40 years later, observed that, quote, as the white population advanced, that of the Indians necessarily receded until, quote, the soil to which the crown originally claimed title, DOD, being no longer occupied by its ancient inhabitants, was parceled out according to the will of the sovereign power. Hey, nobody here anymore. I guess it's ours. Now, we have not just legal title, we have the right of possession because our settlements gradually gradually move them along. No war. Only a few years later, Marshall, in a series of formative cases, would famously justify federal authority by analogizing American Indians to students in a state of pupillage, standing or perhaps better kneeling, in relation to the United States as wards to their guardians. We see in the rhetoric of these foundational policies and jurisprudential cases the profound ambiguity that surrounded American conceptions of Indians. Were they truly the other beasts of prey, savages to whom no obligation of honesty and fair dealing was due or even possible? Or were they akin to children, wards, and students learning and growing at the knee of the great white father? Throughout the 19th century, virtually every federal policy and Supreme Court decision oscillated opportunistically between these two extremes. These two social constructs of Indians as non-humans and Indians as incompetent humans. On either version, treaties could be made and broken at will by the United States and were, and indigenous people driven like herd animals by the military, either because Indians are not our ontological equals or because breaching treaties or compelling Indian children to attend boarding schools or adults to stay on reservations was what? In the best interest of the federal government's ward. The foundational assumption that one kind of ontological status is superior to another by nature, or one society stands in a superior relation by dint of the former's intrinsic customs and culture 
can only be called racist. This is not a term I use lightly, and it must be understood in its historical particularity. But the long history of federal Indian policy and its application to indigenous people throughout our institutions of jurisprudence, legislation, executive command, military force, education, and yes, missionizing, in short, the engines of civilization on this continent, deserves an accurate description, I believe, if we are ever to get beyond these artifacts of our colonial past. Of course, as philosopher Michel Foucault taught us, power is not merely prescriptive, it is also productive. Nowhere, I think, is as clear to me than in the federal government's treatment of Native Americans after the Civil War. Records of the late 19th century show that where federal policies were applied to individuals and groups of Indians, tactics were aimed at constructing lives that would be, from a modern Western perspective, materially productive, well-informed, disciplined, and spiritually enriched, in a word, civilized. The allotment and assimilationist period of American history, roughly 1871 to 1928, mobilized all social forces at the disposal of the federal government to attempt to produce highly functioning human beings. The ontology supporting this project of turning so-called savages into Jeffersonian yeoman farmers is well captured in the slogan of Colonel Richard Pratt, founder of the first Indian boarding school. In the slogan, he said quite pithily, quote, kill the Indian and save the man. Today, however, we see the legacy of the doctrine of discovery and its racist assumptions and the dysfunctions of many reservation communities where domestic violence, sexual abuse, suicide, alcoholism, drug addiction, and white on Indian crime is rampant. It is estimated that one in three Native American women will be raped in their lifetime. Reservations have exponentially higher rates of material poverty and illness and lower rates of longevity and educational attainment than any other racial group in the United States. While the advent of a new and welcome federal policy of tribal self-determination initiated by President Nixon in 1970 has empowered many tribes to begin the slow process of seeking economic self-sufficiency through gambits like tribal gaming, the historical memory of cultural genocide carried by many native peoples, especially when made all too real by their circumstances of daily life, remains incredibly strong. Such a collective memory exerts its own effective history, its own pervasive internalized frame of reality. It's no wonder that for those tribes that have gained federal recognition and established functional governments and educated some number of their citizens, the cry of tribal sovereignty is often and assertively raised. Tribal sovereignty is the watchword of 21st century Indian law and policy. Eager to overcome 500 years of systematic disempowerment by European and American nations, Indian nations working with allies in the international community are determined to set their own course to overthrow not merely the political and legal arrangements of the past, but the ontological assumptions and discourses of racial inferiority that have gone hand in hand with their subordination as peoples. In my final remarks this evening, I'll sketch out how social movements have begun to advance a new vision of indigenous people's rights, one that quite consciously attempts to overthrow the doctrine of discovery and its legacy. For over 20 years, Scholars and advocates for indigenous peoples around the world had pressed for the latter's protection under international and human rights law and sought repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. Gradually, representatives from affected countries, natives themselves, found the ear of the international community. Using the UN as their principal venue for change, they began to achieve success in effecting pro-indigenous modifications to some of the founding documents of modern international law. The centerpiece of their work expressed in the rhetoric of human rights was a statement called the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Conceived in 1982, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples would eventually become an aspirational document that for its signatory nations stipulates that the religions, folkways, languages, and especially the borders of traditional communities would be protected and respected in law and in fact. The doctrine of discovery would be repudiated 
and in its place the property rights of tribal communities over their traditional lands would be recognized. The work was agonizingly slow. Countries in Central and South America, for example, whose non-indigenous economies flourished under the exploitation of land expropriated in the early decades of the 20th century by giant companies like United Fruit Company, initially resisted any codification of indigenous people's rights, especially to land. In addition to the countries of Central and South America, the property laws of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand were also predicated on the doctrine of discovery. Indeed, in the case of Australia, the doctrine incorporated an extreme, even bizarre concept of personhood according to which Aboriginal peoples were legally invisible. Under the discovery doctrine, as interpreted by Australia, conquered lands were deemed to be terra nullius, a term in principle from Roman law that means land belonging to no one. And under the doctrine in Australia, lands terra nullius could be acquired by conquest, and the continent's Aboriginal peoples had absolutely no legal interests in the land whatsoever, and hence no recourse whatsoever in the law. Only in 1992 did Australia's High Court reject terra nullius and recognize Aboriginal title in a case that's become famous, Mabo v. Queensland No. 2. Though even then, the doctrine of discovery remained effective and allowed the government to extinguish Aboriginal title if it wished, essentially bringing it around to where the United States' position had been, that of a right of occupancy. Though the principle of terra nullius was not applied outside Australia, the doctrine of discovery expressly undergirded the colonization of Canada and New Zealand, and all four of these prosperous modern nations, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, held out to the bitter end against the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Though Canada has judicially qualified its use of the doctrine, none of these four countries, all built on land masses expropriated from their indigenous peoples, has as yet renounced the doctrine as a fundament of their legal system. In 2007, the UN passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The United States refused to sign, as did Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Out of the entire UN General Assembly, they were the only countries to do so. Not until the Obama administration in 2010 did the United States join the ranks of signatory countries. And this was a momentous step, one whose implications will only be felt, I think, in the coming years. As summarized by Rob Williams in his excellent, very recent book, Savage Anxieties, the final declaration binds signatory countries as a matter of human rights to recognize and protect indigenous people's rights to the following. Self-determination. Determine and develop priorities and strategies for exercising their right to development. Maintain and develop their own distinct political, economic, social, and cultural identities and legal systems. And four, not be subjected to genocide or ethnocide or actions aimed at or affecting their integrity as distinct peoples, their cultural values and identities, including the dispossession of land, forced re relocation, assimilation, or integration, and the imposition of foreign lifestyles and propaganda." Unquote. Article 28 of this declaration aims squarely at repudiating the doctrine of discovery. It provides the following, I quote, indigenous peoples have the right to redress by means that can include restitution or when that is not possible, just fair and equitable compensation for the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used and which have been confiscated, taken, occupied, used, or damaged without their free, prior, and informed consent. And two, unless otherwise freely agreed upon by the peoples concerned, compensation shall take the form of lands, territories, and resources equal in quality, size, and legal status, or of monetary compensation or other appropriate redress. In the years after the Declaration's passage, under intense diplomatic and international pressure, all four holdout modern nations tumbled and signed on. Inspired by the passage of the Declaration and by the action of the United States and led by Indian tribes, movement groups around the country began to pay attention to the impact the Doctrine of Discovery has had on Native Americans. 
Many of the mainline Christian churches have dedicated themselves to this cause. The past few years have seen a flurry of ecclesial legislative activity aimed at renouncing the doctrine of discovery and resolving advocacy for the full implementation of the Declaration's terms. The two issues, the problem and solution now, can go hand in hand. The doctrine has been expressly repudiated by the governing or organizational bodies of the Episcopal Church in 2009, the Anglican Church of Canada in 2010, the Methodist Church in 2012, the Society of Friends, the Quakers in 2012, and the World Council of Churches in 2012. Representatives of these and other religious organizations gathered in New York in May of this year to repudiate the doctrine and call for the implementation of the de de Declaration at the 11th session of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. The Catholic Church, which set the ball rolling in the 15th century, has not repudiated the doctrine, despite, despite pleas to do so over the years, most recently by participants at the May 2012 Forum. However, the Vatican representative to the UN is reported, reported to have said the underlying papal document is, quote, ancient history and no longer relevant, unquote. In conclusion, I hope my remarks have convinced you that the, quote, unquote, decept deceptively simple doctrine of discovery is more than an artifact of the 15th century embedded in early 19th century American jurisprudence. Rather, my archaeology has attempted to show that the doctrine was a tool of empire, arguably the tool of empire, whose effectiveness depended upon a complex ontology of non-European human beings. This ontology simultaneously affirmed the humanity and subjectivity of natives, albeit in a diminished or infantilized way, and denied their humanity, humanity and objectified them as savages and beasts. The doctrine of discovery was deployed in the service of property rights, but its continuing power and legitimacy following the end of Christian monarchies depended on assumptions of race that, as we've seen, influenced the great John Marshall and continue to influence the highest court of this country. The lives and welfare of tribal communities everywhere hang in the balance. Overcoming the doctrine through the international political process and church movements is one thing and a good start. But overcoming the doctrine's racist assumptions about indigenous peoples is another much more challenging endeavor. It is my hope that as the indigenous exorcise the demons of racial inferiority, genocide, and dispossession that we have inherited and exercise our political strength as sovereign Indian nations and aided by the international human rights community, we, the Native Americans of this country, will put forward models and exemplars of relationships to the land that recover the old in the context of the new. We and our allies gladly undertake that challenge. Thank you. about Native Americans, it doesn't raise them up to talk about them. Uh, they assume to be uh, uh, sub, uh, subhuman in some way. So the real focus is on a rather conventional discussion of what, who can be competent to transmit title 
and what the, the prerogatives of the U.S. as a sovereign are uh, to bestow titles. So the, the rhetoric plays in a different key. It plays in the key of property law instead of expressly racial uh, discourse like Dred Scott, Korematsu, and, uh, and, and any number of others. Um, the, um, the doctrine of discovery seems to have these medieval origins in religious exceptions, and then seems to be, at least in those of you talk, buttressed by racism. Do you think racism was there from the very beginning? Uh, I, I think so, and if you if you think back, and I don't claim I don't claim to be an expert on this, but if you think back to how uh, Europe represented to itself undiscovered lands, and what lay beyond undiscovered lands, their monsters be, and as you began to circumnavigate the globe and run into other people, uh, is the assumption that they are just like us, all a natural law, and there is a tradition of that, or is it, that they are not like us, that they are threatening, or perhaps more uh, close to the natural human condition than we are. Either way, they aren't like us. So there was a sense of, of predisposition, I think, uh, to uh, understanding anyone they met as something other than themselves and in an inferior way. Why inferior? Well, because they weren't Christians, for starters. Okay. Um, this is a question that came from uh, the audience. Were there specific biblical texts that were mm. instrumental in the development or the justification mm. of the doctrine of discovery? Mm. We see that with slavery and some mm. other uh, issues. So do you know anything about that in regards to the doctrine of discovery? I'm not aware of particular biblical passages that were used to support it. The, uh, the origins in papal bulls and the uh, disposition of uh, papal bulls not to rely on biblical texts uh, would make me think not. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that as a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but about, well, you, you end on, on, on a hopeful note yeah. about what's, what's to come, with, with, beginning with the UN action, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, work being done by, by Native American uh, tribes and communities themselves. How can local congregations help? I think the to the extent we're referring to local congregations that are not Native American. There's educational work to be done. Uh, and as we were discussing at dinner, it becomes a question of how do you engage Native American communities? Uh, I think that if congregations uh, wish to take this up in some way, uh, engaging Native American communities, maybe the American Indian Center, uh, there may be other uh, places to enter the conversation, uh, and simply say, what can we do for you? be a resource. What are your issues? What are your challenges that we might help you with? And to be prepared to say, no, no thank you. you know, we, we don't want your help. Uh, but it's an educational process. Uh, and part of the kind of homework I think that uh, one can do uh, in advance of that kind of an outreach uh, is exactly this sort of reflection on, on who are these people we're speaking to. What are my assumptions? When I say Indian, what comes to your mind? You know, you're thinking of the Cincinnati Reds, are you thinking about the Washington Redskins? Are you thinking about stereotypes of color, stereotypes of hair? What goes through your mind? And wash that stuff out. Find a way to get that stuff out of your mind. And usually, it's helpful to dialogue with people uh, who are Native American and may not conform to those stereotypes that may, oh, I don't know, wear a suit and tie and have white skin and blue eyes. I don't know. <laughs> you know, college presidents. So, so I'm messing with you tonight. I'm messing with the idea of Indians. But I, I think that that kind of a homework is something that I would invite people to do as a predicate to a successful uh, attempt to ask Native communities what, what help they might receive. All right, well, here's someone who knows more about international law than I do, so I'm going to have to read this one. Uh, the question says there's an international law, in, in, in international law, there's a concept called the precautionary prohibits irreversible harm to man or nature, which has been applied to global warming and climate change. Is there any similar US federal law relevant to Native American rights, prohibiting irreversible harm to man or nature? As applied to Native Americans? Yeah, as applied to Native Americans. I think it would be a stretch to say that it rises to that level of a, a preclusive principle. Uh, there are certain things called the Indians' uh, canons of construction around how to interpret statutory language that essentially give the benefit of the doubt uh, to tribes 
and this is applied when trees are being interpreted. Uh, it's not a guarantee that things will go the way that the tribes want, but it, it's a way of the United States saying, maybe these parties were unequal when they made their bargain, and we should uh, indulge uh, in, in favorable hermeneutic principles as we approach them. Uh, that's a far cry from a protectionary principle. It is a cautionary principle in the manner of interpreting uh, uh, Indian uh, treaties and other bits of legislation. But given what you shared with us today about the doctrine of discovery and how it's played out, especially in the United States, um, this question goes to the uh, idea of, well, what can be done to make all this right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that there, there are probably any number of answers to that, um, and no one answer to that. Uh, but from my experience, education is first, the elimination of stereotypes, the entering into questions about identity, perhaps the generalization of questions of identity in your life, uh, the problematizing of identities themselves. In a more prosaic manner, um, don't rule out things that Indians do. Uh, gaming, for example. Some people just go nuts about gaming, mm -hmm. uh, that that's a terrible thing. I've tried to recite this history in some detail for you and give you a context uh, for the striving that Indian people are doing uh, in one hope that when we come up with economic methods for creating the material conditions for our culture and its growth and our self-understanding, don't throw that out of hand. You know, we are not, uh, as, as Indian people, uh, starting from the same place uh, as people who have the luxury of saying, I won't have pain. Where do you get your money? Is it handed out to you in uh, rations by the federal government every month? I doubt it. Uh, we are not dealing with equal positions here. So try to um, have some thoughtfulness, I would say, around how Indian nations are trying to assert their sovereignty uh, around the material conditions that they find conducive to helping them uh, restore and, and energize their cultures. Again, my answer is not to say there is something that you can step up and do to solve their problems. That would be a huge mistake. We've had enough of that, right? Uh, help Indians solve the problems that they see, they see themselves. Allow them some space to work that out. So Let's thank Dr. Ray.